Hello everyone and welcome back to week seven, uh, your second last week of the pregnancy and postpartum athlete course where we'll be discussing returning to sports specifically with the endurance athlete. And so Christina and I tried to divvy up this these last two weeks appropriately in the sense that um, I tend to have a little bit more experience with the endurance side of sport, whereas she tends to have a bit more experience with the strength side of sport. So you'll get to hear um, each of us talking in our own uh, comfort zone, so to speak. So the outline for today, uh, we'll be looking at where the research is at with regards to returning to endurance sport after um, delivering a baby. We'll talk about the barriers um, that are in existence in returning to endurance exercise, considerations to make when returning to physical activity. We'll look at evaluating readiness to run, uh, running EMG data, kinematics and mechanics, as well as strategies for the symptomatic endurance athlete. So as of now, there is a huge gap in the literature about returning to endurance sport post in the postpartum period. Um, there's absolutely nothing out there about running postpartum with the exception of the recent expert opinion guidelines on returning to running postpartum that were put out by Tom Goon, Grady Donnelly, and Emma Brockwell just this year. So I've linked those in the course notes. It's an excellent resource to have in your back pocket. Um, but in general, there's really very little primary evidence in this area. Um, and we know that there are a lot of inconsistencies right now in the literature about that six-week checkup. Um, so a lot of women are being told that they can return to uh, their full exercise regime at this six-week point. And as PTs, physical therapists, we tend to be fairly uh, type A and uh, we like our formulas, like a recipe, around how we can return to running. But we have to remember that everyone is different and we need to treat our patients like the unique individuals that they are. So I hope that one key takeaway that you get from this lecture is that um, there is no formula to return to running postpartum or to return to endurance sport. It's going to be different based on everyone's individual needs and goals. So... First, we'll take a little look at the barriers to physical activity participation uh, in the postpartum period. Um, so running is a huge thing that women want to return to postpartum. In 2017, about 56 million Americans participated in running and jogging. Uh, and of these, majority were female, so 63% were female. Uh, and of those, about 75% of the women were of childbearing years um, were mothers. So we know that running is something that people would like to do, and we know that a lot of barriers exist from getting them to achieve that goal. We also know the multitude of benefits that running can offer. So if a woman's preferred sport is running and she's unable to because of pelvic floor dysfunction, um, then it might be a barrier for her to participate in exercise in general if it's if if her only preferred sport is running. Um, so we have to be able to work with these women in whatever capacity they come in. And if they have one goal in mind, then we need to help them achieve that goal and not tell them to do something else like swimming that they may not be interested in. We have to work with the client to help them achieve their self-selected goal. Um, so despite a lot of the positive health, comes, health outcomes that are associated with physical activity, uh, a lot of different studies have shown that about 25% of women in the United States don't participate in regular physical activity, and that physical activity participation is even lower for women in the postpartum period. So we have a lot of work to do with this group of women. So first we'll talk about the physical factors that can become a barrier to physical activity participation. Uh, of course, a big part of where we can intervene as physical therapists are the physical barriers to running. This would be our bread and butter. So things like muscle weakness, pelvic girdle pain, which hopefully you now have the tools to help out with, 
uh, urinary incontinence, which also hopefully you can help out with a little bit more after taking this course, as well as prolapse. Uh, musculoskeletal injuries and musculoskeletal pain are also barriers that obviously we can have a huge impact on as physical therapists. Uh, personal factors to uh, be a barrier to physical activity participation. So things like not having childcare or perhaps not being able to afford childcare. I know particularly in Canada, childcare is a huge issue right now. Uh, in terms of being able to get into any sort of daycare center is very, they're very overloaded right now. Um, so that can be a big barrier. Uh, Age-related changes in the body, um, time constraints. So obviously this is a very busy time. You're breastfeeding so frequently or um, having to tidy up after the mess or whatever is going on. There's a lot of things limiting the time available to exercise. Uh, financial barriers can be huge. A lot of women uh, are on maternity leave and might not be making as much money as what they would typically make. So uh, finances can limit someone's ability to make it to a gym. Um, and some in uncertainty in navigating that traditional gym environment in the postpartum period when uh, confidence levels have changed and um, perhaps they don't know exactly what to do and they're a bit intimidated by a, a, a traditional gym environment. So at our gym, I run an exercise class for new mothers called Strong Like Mom. And this is a picture of the chaos that happens during this class. We've got um, mats and babies and, and toddlers running around and it's, it's chaos, but I absolutely love it. Um, so the program, this program that we're doing is also being used as a research initiative with the head obstetrician at our nearby hospital, uh, where women who have experienced gestational diabetes or preeclampsia during their pregnancy can exercise as secondary prevention to the development of these diseases in future pregnancies and with older age. Um, so... With that, they can bill, the women who have had gestational diabetes or preeclampsia can bill um, the class under physiotherapy because it's run by me, a physiotherapist, um, which can eliminate the financial barrier if the person has insurance coverage for physical therapy. Um, the class also allows them to bring their baby, obviously, to the class, so that can eliminate that childcare barrier. And um, because the class is held by a res registered physical therapist and it's done among other women who are in the same boat as them, it can help to eliminate that lack of confidence in going to a traditional gym barrier. Psychological factors. So um, this can be lack of motivation or confidence like we already talked about. Um, so that's kind of a bit of an overlap as well as things like postpartum depression or anxiety or anything that um, can affect the mental health of the person. And physiological factors that can be a barrier. So of course there can be a reduction in cardiovascular fitness that remains, um, especially with the deconditioning that's gone on the last how many months, as well as uh, gastrointestinal dysfunction that people can be going on with some of the change in hormones during this period. Um, so in all, we just wanna be able to help our, parent, our patients manage some of these barriers and perhaps get them moving in spite of these barriers. Uh, so now we're gonna look at some of the considerations in returning to physical activity after, uh, after giving birth. So of course this process needs to be individualized. It's fairly common for women that I see to be given the green light to get back into um, their regular exercise routine at their six week postpartum uh, appointment with their medical provider. And sure, in some cases this is going to be appropriate. However, in other cases, women may need more or less time depending on some of these considerations. So just remember that we need to consider returning to sport in the postpartum period in the same way that we would post-injury. So there are both physical and emotional trauma that women experience, and there's no pelvic floor or core that's left unscathed. So I like to compare it to my patients' 
that if they had a tear in their quadriceps muscle, they wouldn't be running three weeks postpartum or post-injury. Um, and if they had a major abdominal surgery, um, similar to a C-section, for heaven's sake, they wouldn't be advised to hold off on running for set. Uh, they would be advised to hold off on running for several months. So um, it is an injury. The, there are tissues that have been torn um, most of the time or cut into with a C-section. So there are definitely a lot of considerations that we have to make in returning to physical activity, more than just a standardized green light at six weeks. So first thing we need to consider is their medical status. Um, many of the physiological changes of pregnancy that Christina would have talked about in earlier lectures will continue for the first four to six weeks. Um, so the postpartum athlete should receive medical clearance from a provider, either um, their medical doctor or also maybe a, a pelvic floor physical therapist. Um, and again, the six-week standardized checkup. Um, like I said, the green light at six weeks should be more of a yellow light. Uh, I have a client on my caseload right now who received the green light at six weeks and she jumped right back into her usual high intensity trail running that she had been doing uh, before being pregnant. Um, and she had some pelvic floor dysfunction going on. She had some stress incontinence that started to get worse. So I had to remind her that she had just spent the last four months plus, probably longer, not running. And that the demand that she was asking of her body to jump right back into things after deconditioning was quite high. So there is a lot to do to gradually increase the load. And we'll talk about some load management strategies down the road here. Um, but on the other hand, if she had not been a, a runner and her usual act activity was something like swimming, that process would also look differently. So this is why we need to have an individualized approach for each woman and not use a blanket statement or a recipe of six weeks to rest and heal before getting back into exercise. Uh, second thing we'll have to consider is psychosocial status of the female athlete. So um, there are kind of two ends of the spectrum that we have to consider. So we know as physiotherapists the multitude of benefits that exercise can have on mental health. Um, so, of course, psychosocial well-being can be improved with aerobic exercise. That would make it a very green light scenario, especially with all of the, the changes going on with our mental and emotional status in this uh, postpartum period. Um, however, we have to consider the other end of the coin, too, in that um, if the person is using exercise as their only coping me mechanism and they're doing it compulsively um, or perhaps if they're doing it also in the presence of disordered eating then we might have to consider aerobic exercise more of a yellow light and we have to consider the role of uh, red s or relative energy deficiency in sport and how um, if someone is not um, having the cal caloric demand that they need in order to do these activities that they're asking of themselves, uh, they can put themselves at higher risk for different problems down the road, like uh, stress fractures or amenorrhea, um, which can lead to other issues like fertility issues down the road. So um, just keeping that in mind and considering your person that you are working with when you are advising aerobic exercise. Um, the other thing to consider is, is the social support that they have. So having good social support is considered an enabler to exercise. Um, so if you have a patient perhaps who doesn't have great social support, then this might be a barrier for them to getting back into exercise. And we also know that stress has a huge role on healing. So stress has been found to slow healing times by 40 to 60%. So in someone who has, who is going through some healing, which everyone in the postpartum period is, if they are having stress in their lives or even anxiety, postpartum depression, um, this might mean they might need a little bit more of a gradual return to exercise. The status of the pelvic floor. So my, my area of expertise here. Um, so 
Of course, it's going to depend on the type of endurance exercise that they are wanting to return to. So um, it might take a little less time to return to something like swimming or biking, which is uh, lower impact than something like running. Uh, but in doubt, if you're in doubt, just refer on to a pelvic floor physical therapist. And you can also try and modify around their symptoms, which we'll discuss in the last few slides of today. Um, but in some cases, we will need to consider uh, it a red flag to return to exercise until they see another healthcare provider. So, or sorry, a red light. Um, so if they have any red flags present, like vaginal bleeding, then... Um, definitely we want to hold off on exercise until we get that assessed properly. So the impact of running on our pelvic floor muscles can be quite high. Um, ground reaction forces are 1.6 to 2.5 times our body weight during running at a moderate pace. Um, and high impact sports have been shown to increase our risk for urinary incontinence compared to low impact sports. But we have found in some research that being able to appropriately brace the pelvic floor during high impact exercise can be protective against pelvic organ prolapse and urinary incontinence. Uh, next consideration that we have to make in returning to physical activity is sleep. So of course, sleep def deprivation is a huge problem in the postpartum period. Um, women are waking up several times a night to feed their infant and uh, so they're not getting that good quality deep REM sleep that they require for physiological growth and repair. And sleep deprivation can also increase our risk for injury. So this is just something to consider when we're getting women back into their sport is that they may be at a higher risk for developing injury and they may not be able to uh, repair their or heal their tissues as quickly as someone who's getting a full night's sleep. Nutrition is also a big thing that is important in this time. So we need proper nutrition to be able to heal our tissues appropriately. Um, so if someone is not getting lots of color, color in their diet, so lots of vegetables, fruits, uh, healthy fats, protein in their diet, then they're not going to be healing uh, as well as someone who is. Mode of delivery. So um, I often see people who think, I don't know why I'm having urinary incontinence because I had a C-section delivery. And although a cesarean can be um, protective on the pelvic floor, both can have their pitfalls. So generally it's it's been assumed that uh, recovery will be longer and the risks are greater with a cesarean section. Um, and Although C-section appears to be protective against pelvic floor dysfunction, it doesn't necessarily exempt you from pelvic floor dysfunction. So I see plenty of women who have had a C-section who still have stress urinary incontinence. Um, I also see women who've had a cesarean section who have prolapse. So um, it doesn't exempt you, um, although there is some evidence to suggest that it's protective. And then in women who are considering a vaginal birth after c-section or who have had one um, in considering it it can be a, a big discussion that re needs to be had to, with the care providers so um, particularly in my patients who have a pelvic organ prolapse they um, they are very nervous to try for the vaginal birth after c-section um, in fear of making their prolapse worse um, and it, there are a multi multitude of risks and benefits either way. So it's just about discussing this with your care providers and making sure that they are making the best decision for them. Regardless of whether you have a cesarean section or a vaginal delivery, the abdominal wall strength is going to be compromised. So our abdominal muscles all become stretched uh, when we're carrying the baby. So of course, when these muscles are lengthened, they're gonna become weakened and our function is gonna be compromised as well. And we already know that diastasis recti is present in 100% of women in their third trimester. 
It's also present in about 39% of women at six months postpartum. And having a DRA can impair abdominal function, uh, particularly in the rotational planes and being able to sit up out of bed. So just keeping that in mind, regardless of cesarean or vaginal delivery, there's going to be uh, an impairment in abdominal muscle function and recruitment. Uh, and then another consideration in returning to running is going to be that if they had a cesarean section, they're going to have a large abdominal scar there, and they have just gone through major abdominal surgery. So we have to consider the healing that is involved with that, as well as the usual scar techniques. So we talked about this in the lab already. Um, but also scarring can occur regardless of the mode of delivery. So if it's a cesarean, it's going to be a, a large abdominal scar that goes through several layers of tissue. Um, but if they had a vaginal birth, they can also have tearing into their perineum, perhaps larger grade tears into their external anal sphincter. So um, either way, there's going to be some scar care involved. Uh, mobilization of the scar tissue uh, can help to reduce inflammation, fibrosis, and improve tissue remodeling. This is stuff we already know from physiotherapy school. Um, desensitization strategies are also really useful. Um, so what I'll do is have my patients uh, touch their scar with several different materials to help uh, desensitize it and, and alter their nervous system sensitivity around that area. So um, I'll, I'll tell them all sorts of different materials. I'll mention um, like something soft, like, like fur pelts or something like that. Um, they can use uh, cotton balls. They can try different more coarse material like an old loofah or a dried up washcloth. Um, anything that's new and novel will be a good experience for the scar to, to become desensitized. The participant's definition of physical activity will also be a consideration in their return to physical activity. So what type of endurance exercise are they consider that are they interested in pursuing? Um, so of course, if they're more interested in things like swimming, walking, and biking, that's going to be more of a green light than some higher impact things like um, jogging, elliptical, or rowing. And then if they are wanting to get back into running, sprinting, double unders, and box jumps, that's going to be a different story. And it's going to be a bit more of a yellow to red light, depending on uh, their status. So it's, of course, going to depend on their stage postpartum and depend on their symptoms and all of these other considerations that we've already been looking at. Um, but if their only goal is to return to swimming, that is going to be less threatening on their pelvic floor than something like double unders because generally the ground reaction forces are greater with the activities between the yellow and red light uh, than the green ones. So this is just a systematic review um, put out in 2018 and it tells us that high impact activities put a, about a four and a half times greater increase uh, in the development of urinary incontinence than lower impact activities. So just again, keeping that in mind um, that you might have to ease in differently. Um, and in order to ease in, we have to consider our loading principles. So one analogy that I like to use in terms of training load and returning to um, training in endurance sport is the straw that broke the camel's back. So in this case, the camel um, can be the runner or it doesn't really matter which sport they're returning to, it would be the athlete. Um, the load of hay would be the maximum workload that the runner can tolerate safely. So that is their load capacity. And then the last straw is the uh, overload that causes the injury. So when the load capacity is, incre uh, is exceeded. So that last straw, that you put on the camel's back that broke it is when we exceed the capacity that the athlete is able to handle at this time. So training load versus train load, load capacity. So training load is the physical work that you do to prepare for your event. So like the distance that you run, whereas the load capacity is our ability to handle that load. 
So a common scenario that I see every day when I'm treating uh, runners in clinic would be that their training load is outweighing their load capacity. So they've pushed their training on, they'll increase it too rapidly, and they will exceed what their body is able to cope with. And the result would be that something becomes dysfunctional. So either they have pain, or they have incontinence, or they have more symptoms of their prolapse. Uh, so our bodies are amazing, of course. We're made up of complex living tissue that constantly adapts to load, and we can adapt and, and move forward with the load that we're able to handle. But on the other hand, if we push it too far, then we can't adapt quickly enough, and our, um, our load will exceed that capacity that we're able to handle. Um, and another point that's interesting to raise is that when we're considering load capacity, we want to um, make sure that we know that it's unlikely that passive interventions like massage or manipulation or acupuncture or injections will have any long-term effects on our tissue's capacity. So the only way to do this is to gradually increase the load that you're wanting to be able to manage. With that said, training load can't explain every injury that we're going to see. So our ability to uh, be able to handle the training load that we're under is going to be influenced by a lot of different factors. So things like um, our underlying strength, our movement patterning and control, our flexibility and our uh, running mechanics. Um, things like psych psychosocial factors like stress, our mental health. Um, our fear and beliefs. Now, I already mentioned that stress has been shown to slow healing times by 40 to 60 percent. Uh, and then other lifestyle factors that we already talked about, like sleep and diet. Uh, our final consideration when returning to physical activity would be breastfeeding. And the good news is that uh, there is no impact of aerobic exercise on milk production, um, or the composition of your milk supply, and there's no effect on infant growth. So um, we can say that breastfeeding is a green light to exercise. The only considerations that you would have to make is that uh, you might want to consider feeding prior to doing aerobic exercise so that you don't have the discomfort of an engorged breast, and to make sure that you're hydrating enough while doing this. So when can we return to endurance exercise postpartum? Uh, well, again, it's not going to be any recipe, um, but uh, we want to make sure that the patient has received medical clearance from their physician, so there's no red flags present. Um, ideally, they've had an assessment by a pelvic floor physical therapist, and ideally, they are asymptomatic. However, if they are symptomatic, then... Um, a gradual, symptom-free, graduated return alongside a pelvic floor phys physical therapist would be ideal. And pain can be permissible if it's moderate, so as long as it's not, um, say, over a 4 out of 10 pain and it's not lasting more than 24 hours after exercise. So ideally, they would have that good foundation of breath work and core training during the fourth trimester, uh, and low-grade strengthening that Christina has already talked to you guys about. Uh, in order to test readiness to run or to return to endurance sport in general, we need to use our physical therapy skills that we already have. So um, checking all the things prior to this, this endurance sport that they're hoping to return to, making sure that they don't have any troubles with those before getting them back into the sport that they would like to get into. So if they want to get back into running, you could check to make sure that they are totally fine in their activities of daily living. They have no symptoms during those. Um, they are fine to walk for say 30 minutes. They can do um, squats and jump and bound and they are asymptomatic with those. And then from there, really the only way to know if they're truly ready to get back into their endurance sport is to get them to do their endurance activity. So it, I will look at these things, these, these uh, walking, jumping, these readiness to run tests, but it doesn't tell me as much as what happens when they actually just try to go out to run. 
And so I'm not going to get them to go out and run 30 minutes right off the hop, but I might put them on the treadmill and get them to try jogging for two minutes and see if they have any symptoms with that. And then from there, we can just progress. And you also want to make sure they're demonstrating good breathing patterns, good awareness of their core and pelvic floor muscles uh, before they jump right back into their sport as well. And like I just mentioned, we can start small and do a graduated return to endurance activity. So like I just mentioned, if they are on the treadmill and they're asymptomatic with two minutes of jogging, then next time they can try three. And then if that's asymptomatic, the next time they can bump that up a little bit. And the amount that they increase by is going to depend on the person themselves um, because we know that there can be kind of a, a risk versus reward uh, payoff in terms of uh, if we jump them up too quickly they're at a higher risk for potentially being symptomatic um, but if perhaps they have a goal to return to so maybe they have a 10k coming up in four months then you might not be able to achieve their goal quickly enough if you only get them to increase by one minute each week so we're going to have to weigh these or balance these scenarios for each of our patients um, and ideally we can start them at some lower impact uh, endurance activity to get their cardio up first with some cross training before we get them back into um, some of the higher impact exercise. So if they are a runner, then we want to get their cardiovascular system up to snuff with some of these other lower impact activities like biking, for example. And then um, we can gradually increase the impact as their body is able to handle it. All right, so we'll kind of switch gears now and jump into some running EMG data. So in general, it was found that there's no difference in pelvic floor muscle EMG data in continent versus incontinent women. Uh, there are greater ground reaction forces during running and running does require stronger pelvic floor muscles. Uh, and our pelvic floor muscles actually drop prior to the heel strike. So in that eccentric moment, there is a bit of a, a drop in the pelvic floor muscles. Running kinematics and mechanics. So in the general population, we don't really have the evidence to suggest that one foot strike pattern is superior to another in terms of injury prevention. Um, and we definitely don't have any research out there as far as I'm aware uh, that demonstrates a direct relationship between continence and uh, heel strike pattern. So in general you'll just have to do what feels best, best for your patient um, and see kind of what works best for them. Uh, vertical displacement and knee flexion angle so there's been found to be no change in continence based on the amount of of height that they get during their run and the amount that their knee flexes during their run. Uh, pelvic tilt, so there was some inconsistencies that I found in the literature around pelvic tilt and pelvic floor muscle activation. So Capson et al. in 2011 found that there is higher pelvic floor muscle activation at rest in those who had uh, hypolordotic posture, so a posterior pelvic tilt, um, whereas Chen et al. in 2005, um, they, he didn't measure pelvic tilt directly, but what he did was have the patient in a dorsiflex position, which he reported increased their anterior pelvic tilt, and said that there was higher pelvic floor muscle activation in that position. So, um, Generally, I mean, I think that not having a super anteriorly pelvic tilt or a super posteriorly pe pelvic tilt during running is going to be um, kind of optimal. So uh, Julie Weeb, if you look at her stuff, she tends to recommend, um, not so much with pelvic tilt, but she will tend to recommend stacking the rib cage over their hips during running to... Um, to have the optimal length tension relationship of the pelvic floor muscles to be able to engage them properly. Uh, late swing phase into early stance phase. So 
Um, one person found, or one study found that glute max activation was the greatest when decelerating the thigh and extending the hip during running. And another study found that co-activation of the glute max occurred with the levator A9 muscles. So perhaps there's a relationship between continence and um, glute max activation, but that would be a far reach based on the evidence that we currently have. Trunk rotation, so there's been found to be co-activation of the trunk rotators uh, with the transversus abdominis and pelvic floor muscles. But again, this is another big stretch in connecting, connecting bits and pieces from the literature. Um, and just because there's greater pelvic floor muscle activation does not mean that uh, there's greater continence. So this is a bit of a stretch, but in general, getting someone to rotate through their trunk um, is going to be good for the running mechanics in general. So I tend to recommend getting some more trunk rotation uh, in their running patterning. So basically the study uh, that was recently released does not re recommend um, contracting some of these other related muscles in order to train the pelvic floor muscles. So what they did was have women perform internal rotation of the hips, external rotation of the hips, abduction of the hips, adduction of the hips, contraction of the glutes, uh, pelvic tilt involving mostly rectus abdominis, uh, in drawing, primarily activating transversus abdominis, uh, abdominal crunches, deep inspiration, deep expiration, and they found that um, the muscles that were activated during these weren't, weren't contracting the pelvic floor muscles to the same extent as um, isolating a pelvic floor muscle contraction. So, so a lot of the studies that I was just referencing probably aren't going to be super valid, but again, we don't have, uh, or I shouldn't say valid, but um, they aren't drawing the conclusions that we are looking for, but at, in the, at the end of the day, we don't have the evidence to support um, differences in running mechanics altering continents. Uh, cadence, so we know that um, having an increased stride rate or a faster cadence will help to reduce ground reaction force, uh, shock attenuation, and energy absorbed at the hip, knee, and ankle. Um, we don't know the effect of cadence on pelvic floor muscle uh, activation or continence. Uh, and this study found that greater weekly training load uh, had had a relationship with decreased pelvic floor muscle strength. Um, however, we don't want correlation uh, to equal, or we know that correlation does not equal causation. So um, it could be that there is a relationship, but uh, it could there could be other factors contributing as well. All right. So um, getting into kind of how you guys can help to modify someone's symptoms while they are returning to their endurance sport. Um, so in general, I always say to try something new. So every athlete is unique. So you can experiment a little bit and see what's going to work best for your particular uh, athlete. Um, and so if your patient becomes symptomatic one time while you're experimenting, you haven't created damage, but you've provided yourself and the patient with more information. So we're pretty fortunate in our profession that there's a fairly low risk for actually doing harm to the patient. So um, if you try to get them running for two minutes and they become symptomatic, then that's great information for you to be able to carry things further. Um, and, you know, not everyone can get to a pelvic floor physical therapist, right? So maybe finances are a barrier. Maybe they are too uncomfortable to see a pelvic floor physiotherapist. So um, you guys have to be able to kind of manage these things as, as best you can and know what to look out for in helping these women. Um, so... I don't know, so some of these things that I tend to experiment on my pace, patients with, I, I kind of make things up on the fly. It's not going to be the most evidence-based thing out there. And and we don't really know why some of these changes will work. So um, perhaps they're biomechanical, perhaps they're psychological, 
probably a biopsychosocial combination of these things, but we know that it takes about 17 years between um, scientific research and, and that translating to uh, patient care. So the best that we can do in the absence of research is to experiment ourselves and, and try and be our own research lab. <laughs> So the first thing um, that we'll talk about is double unders. So usually this is within more CrossFit, but it is an endurance, uh, more of an endurance activity, I suppose. So um, one thing that you can try with your patients who are symptomatic with double unders would be a pre-contraction. So this one's fairly obvious but having them try to do essentially a Kegel before each jump. Um, but if that's possible, it is fairly difficult and it's somewhat unrealistic to be able to do that before each jump. So um, just keep that in mind. You can get them to try that and see if that works for them, but it may not work if they are doing multiple double unders in a row. and. Uh, even if it does, then you have to consider what the demands that they're trying to get back into are. So perhaps they can only get to four double unders in a row while doing their pre-contractions and then they start to become incontinent. So then perhaps trying to progress gradually from there. But there, there may be a maximum port, point where they just can't achieve and they can't get back into um, you can try different strategies like flexing the hips with a jump, so that might have a change on their pelvic tilt, or extending their hips with a jump, so bringing their hips through, see if that makes a difference for them. Uh, you can try getting them to do a single leg jump and see if that is any different than a double leg jump. Uh, you can work on the breathing mechanics, so exhaling before each jump, seeing if that makes a difference. Uh, some of our loading principles, so like I was just mentioning, um, gradually increasing the load. So don't get them starting at 100 double unders, maybe just three of them and see how that goes and gradually build from there. And uh, kind of if, if some of your conservative management doesn't work, then of course sending them to pelvic floor physio or trying a pessary and seeing if that works. Um, another progression that you can use for double unders is, uh, well, obviously, first you can start with single skips and see if those are um, symptomatic. And then if they are able to do single skips and they're asymptomatic, then you can try uh, getting them to jump up and then tap their hands twice on their leg before landing. And that's kind of a, a precursor to being able to do a double under and will help with the coordination of that movement as well. So like I mentioned, all of these are experimental. They are um, not, not always, not necessarily backed by research, but you can play around with these things and see if it makes any difference for the patient. Uh, so if they're biking or spinning, then you can play around with the resistance. So um, some women tend to feel better when they are working at a higher resistance than uh, letting their legs kind of loosely spin around the wheels. Uh, you can see if standing pedaling makes a difference. Perhaps it will make them less incontinent or have less symptoms of prolapse. Uh, you can also, in standing, get them to try different positions of their hips. So maybe a more anteriorly or posteriorly pelvic uh, tilted pelvis and see if that makes a difference for their symptoms. Um, you can play around with weight shifting from one leg to the other. Again, the breathing mechanics and using their diaphragm to breathe. Uh, and you can also play around with the toe drive versus heel drive. So when they're pushing down on those pedals, um, seeing if it makes a difference to push into their toes versus more into their heels. Running. So um, with running, there's a lot of different factors that you can look at, and a lot of them we just talked about in the mechanics and kinematics uh, piece of the lecture. So things like stride length, so we know that there is uh, less, less force production through some of the major joints with smaller steps and uh, quicker cadence. 
So you could play around with the stride length and seeing if shorter steps makes a difference. Um, torso positioning, so um, that can go hand in hand with the anterior or posterior pelvic tilt or using what Julie Weeb suggests in stacking the rib cage over the hips. Um, again, you can play around with the thoracic rotation and seeing if activating some of those um, oblique muscles or perhaps transversus abdominis will translate to activation of the pelvic floor muscles a little bit better. Um, you can see how uphill versus downhill will have an effect. So um, tends to be that everything is a bit more loosey-goosey downhill, so they might be more symptomatic downhill than uphill, but you can play around with that a little bit. Um, you can play around with the speed that they're running at, um, which goes hand-in-hand -hand with the cadence. Again, the, the breathing mechanics, the loading principles of gradually increasing load, and pessary, again, is an option. Um, but I think it's important to keep in mind that it's, it's probably not possible, and it's also probably not good for us to just hold a tight pelvic floor muscle contraction and grip your pelvic floor muscles the entire time. Um, our pelvic floor muscles are meant to go through an excursion and they're meant to lengthen and shorten um, throughout its full range. So gripping these muscles the whole time you're running probably isn't a good strategy either. And in my opinion, can probably lead to um, hypertonicity and, and excessive cross-linkage of those muscle fibers, which can also lead to incontinence anyway. So making sure that they're breathing with their diaphragm while they're running um, to make sure that they're, they're letting those pelvic floor muscles go through their full excursion. Burpees. So um, with the burpees, we can also do that pre-contraction before the jump component of the burpee, um, as well as doing the exhale before the jump component of the burpee. Um, in my Strong Like Mom class, I get I get my athletes to do uh, burpees, but we often will do a lower impact version. So I always give them the option to step out and step in uh, from the burpee or to do it from a bench so that they're not going right to the floor and they have the option to take out the initial jump. So these can always kind of be modified to ma be made a little bit more appropriate for the activity. Uh, again, you want to consider the loading principles and pessary as an option. So in the end, uh, as summary, we just need to respect the individual's uniqueness. So there are no recipes, no formulas that we can use for every single person should be patient-centered and and um, we should have the patient's goals in mind. So maybe they don't care if they can do a double under 50 times without leaking. Maybe they only care if they can try one one time and, and feel satisfied in achieving that goal. Um, we also have to consider the whole system. Um, so the ability to just perform a Kegel isn't everything. I see lots of women who have great strength in their Kegel, they're able to perform a grade four out of five strength Kegel and they still have a lot of symptoms uh, of either their prolapse or of incontinence. So you wanna take into consideration their nutrition, their sleep, their mental health, all of those things in the healing process, um, which can be really important. Um, and then empowering them. So showing them that they can do it and don't let fear be the limiting factor from getting them back into your into their goals. Particularly with something like prolapse, I think that um, a lot of women are just fearful that any movement or anything that they do is going to make it worse. And so just show them that it's possible to do the things that they want to do again. And sometimes that alone can eliminate a huge barrier in getting back to exercise. Awesome. So that's it for today, your second last lecture. Uh, thank you so much for listening and tune into the lab and the extra materials that I've provided for this lecture. Thank you.